actually uh, majored in acting, but I was a musical theater major, and I was a background singer for before that. I started background vocalist when I was 16 in, in bands. But as a child, I, I was I, I loved music more than anything, and I would like see Diana Ross and, and make a dress for my Barbie that looked like Diana Ross. I, all my clothes were ma made by, um, were like from Cher or somebody. I just always loved music and still do. And then I end up, you know, getting Ray was such a big privilege for me because I never thought I would get to do a film with music in it. So, and then it spun off and became Dream Girl. So I had, those are really two of my favorite films I worked on. How did you get the call for Dream Girl? Very strange. Well, I was at FITM, and the Ray exhibit was up, and Bob Mackey came by and was very, and um, of course I almost passed out, and uh, <laughs> complimented me, and then he introduced me to a, a, someone he was with, Jonathan King, and Jonathan said, oh, I'm going to be you know, one of the producers of Dream Girls. We're probably going to give you a call, and I just was like, what? Okay. Very exciting. Well, music seems to be a common thread with some of your projects, like Ray and Bob Mackey did Sonny and Cher. Yeah. Um, did director Bill Condon make use of your musical history? I mean, he knew I did Ray, so he was very, he asked me if I had anything to do with the choreography, which I didn't have on that show. But I do understand choreography and the movement of clothes with, with dance. So I think that was a big factor in getting the job. It seemed like he was consulting with you on some of the numbers. Did Why? Well, you know, we'd never have to. Beyonce, of course, knows how to dance, and Nika. But sometimes Jennifer, some knew she had a hard time with movement. So sometimes we would just discuss, well, maybe she should just do this, or well, because she didn't really, you know, she's effy. <laughs> Well, this wasn't just about the costumes. It was about three African-American women and the issues we all face when trying to, when striving to make something great of ourselves. So what was your initial vision upon reading the script? Did it coincide with Bill Condon's? Um, it did, you know, but while we were in prep and we were interviewing and... and uh, bringing people in to um, audition the role of um, Effie's brother, Cece, John Legend came in, and he just knocked out, out of the ballpark. I mean, it was unbelievable. And Bill's like, mm, you know, he's not an actor. I'm like, who cares? It's John Legend. It's John Legend. <laughs> I was on my bin. I was like, Eddie, on my bin. You know, please hire John Legend. And so when I watched the film, I keep thinking, that, that could have been John Legend. <laughs> and then we had a few, you know, you know, I, I'd go, oh, I really want a mahogany scene when we get to the 60s for, for Beyonce. He's like, no, that's, that's not good. And then we did it anyway. With the hat and the black suit. Like, I, just, I said, she needs to be overkill. Like, she, why was she at home dressed like that? She's just so bored. So he let me have a few. But otherwise, he was, he was amazing to work with. Well, that black suit and hat was really impressive. I really liked the way she looked in that. What can you tell us about working with Beyonce? Well, she's, uh, she's so easygoing. And she's, um, she, will work, she will wear anything. I mean, when it doesn't even look good, which it ends up looking good in five minutes, I don't know how she does that. She can manipulate her body, and all of a sudden it looks great. No, look, I, it looks fine. <laughs> It's like, I guess it does. But she was definitely the easiest of all to, to work with. It didn't look like she had a bad angle. No. <laughs> no. Um, and what was your experience with then Hollywood newbie Jennifer Hudson? She's very nice, but so green, you know. I mean, I, I felt so bad for her sometimes. It just was, She comes off of a... TV show, you know, she wins a, well, she loses, I believe, vocal, and then she's, you know, hired, and then she's hired late, we're now at 10 weeks prep, I have to change half the costumes due to her body type, because of her, this part, <laughs> and we had already designed, you know, most of them, it was, uh, 
really challenging and some for someone who doesn't know how to dance and I remember this one day you got a text from Bill Condon. It was like his first note on her. And it was about her triple D's? Yeah, he was like, oh my gosh, you cannot use that spaghetti strap dress. You better redesign that dress right now. It is not going to work. <laughs> but she shook him. <laughs> yeah, she still did it, yeah. It was very funny. He goes, I go, well, can't we just change hers? No, all three girls have to look exactly alike. And they all need to be somewhat the same height. Well, Jennifer's 5'9", Beyonce's 5'7", and Anika's 5'3". So Anika's heels were like the three to four inches every, I mean, wow. How tall were Beyonce's? Three. She's her standard. <laughs> and Jennifer? Jennifer's were one or one and a half. Worked for What her. was the problem? She couldn't? Move. Well, no, well, for one, she's taller than the rest, so oh, she okay. had to be, but it was easier for her. She really hadn't worked in heels before as a performer, dancing and singing. Well, what about Jamie Foxx? I love Jamie. I mean, we just finished Ray, so he's, he was great. He was horrible, wasn't he? I mean, he's a horrible human being in that movie. Yeah. <laughs> you know, talk about the Me Too movement. Oh, my gosh. Disgusting. Look at your credits. I mean, you do so many different kinds of films and periods, from Dreamgirls to Westworld. What would you say is, from the vantage point of a designer, are some of the challenges you faced with that? I knew West. I've heard the rumors about Westworld. Everyone knew that. That show, everyone knows that show is very challenging. But I wanted to stay in town, <laughs> and that was the only option. <laughs> So I said, okay, you know, but it became a great, a great lesson. I mean, I, I never had to multitask creatively like that. And, and I find that HBO is very kind and, and they don't like judge hard. They just kind of let you go. So it was, I mean, it, that kind of balances it out a bit, the seven days a week and the shooting five different episodes at once. Crazy. I did my year. <laughs> yeah, I always, I'm, I'm so surprised at how late castings are nowadays. With that. They're like that in film too, nowadays. There's so much media. There's, there's every, there, these actors, and even A, B list actors are spread so thin. You know, they'll be in three series and two films. All simultaneously at once. Oh, well, we, and I don't know how an AD juggles a schedule anymore. It's pretty incredible. Well, on Dreamgirls, there were so many costumes needed in a short amount of time. How did you solve this? Um, prayer, no. Um, <laughs> we did, we only had, uh, I think we had 10 weeks prep. And uh, it, was, it was actually a low budget movie. Um, well, it's an African American film, which means there's no international market. So that's how it, that's why they usually don't have that much money because they don't do well in Europe. At least that's what they told me. We had to really rush all these changes. So luckily we were in Los Angeles and we could use all the houses. But John Hells, John Hells made 85% of those dresses. He made all the performance dresses except for the one that named Con and me fought over for ever. Um, <laughs> And uh, he made half of their casual wear. He did, he did an amazing job. And then this tailor in Texas who did Ray made all of Jamie's clothes. And then Dotson made, all, Dotson who was at Warner Brothers, who passed away, he was an amazing tailor. He made uh, Eddie's um, suit. The five minutes that Eddie let us fit him. <laughs> And then uh, while we were, we actually took 15 minutes where Eddie was like, I thought this was going to be short, you know. And then Dawson told him, well, you want a five-minute suit? <laughs> <laughs> so um, he let us finish, so. What a great sense of humor. <laughs> so Eddie kind of smiled and said, okay, I get it. Were any credits given to any of the contributing designers? Uh, yes, um. Namecon, who had the, the titanium chain mail, I saw it on the runway, and those dresses were like $30,000 each. But I really wanted that fabric. 
so I called him and he agreed because Beyonce was in the movie. And um, I didn't want him to design it. I, so Felipe and I kept sending him designs and then he'd send something back. And I said, so look, it's, it's a collaboration, but basically you're just supplying fabric. <laughs> and, and so I had to, I said, well, you can get a credit and you can, you know, then you'll have Beyonce, you know, there. So that's how I had to, I had to give him a credit and a choice or he wasn't giving me the fabric. And so then he wanted to do another dress, so he did that. The dress that made everything else go crazy. The, the scene where they're in a living room and Eddie's playing his song. Beyonce's in this red dress with this dangles of jewels hanging off and this giant hair. It's like everyone took, they everyone overdid it. The dress was overdone, the hair was overdone, the makeup was overdone. <laughs> It looked like whatever happened to Baby Jane, but um, <laughs> but it worked because she's at that she's overkill anyway at this point. So, but she walked out of the dressing room. We went Omaha. <laughs> you know, the dress is a lot. So could the makeup and hair go down? This is a bit of value. That was this was a valuable lesson for me with hair and makeup. Was that an orange and cream? snake print jumpsuit that Nina, Anika and Lani Rose was wearing with yeah. that duet with Eddie? Oh, the duet with Eddie. Yeah, you know. Eddie was channeling Marvin Gaye in the 70s. So a lot of my inspiration comes right off of a cover of an album for these characters. So like Eddie, we thought, oh yeah, let's just, because the songs were kind of inspired like Marvin Gaye. So I did a lot of uh, looks of Marvin Gaye. But Anika, I found a vintage just... Uh, wrap a jumpsuit that was um, a Diane on Furstenberg and she saw it and called me and said how much she loved it. It was just so freaky. But, you know, you know, after the film and someone someone named Diane's on the phone for you. I'm like, what? <laughs> well, did you encounter any, you know, disappointments while collaborating with some of these strong creative opinions? <laughs> just that dress that Beyonce wore. <laughs> And on Christmas, <laughs> yeah, uh, that day. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, speaking of that crazy hair they put on her that day, did you have any other hair dramas? It was a hair drama every day. You know, we we just got we just plowed through it. Like the the first outfit with the orange dress. First of all, we lost the spaghetti straps because of Jennifer. Then, and then the wigs were like this with bangs. It's very cute and sweet. And then they turned them around and teased the front and the back would have been flat. The hairdresser informed me that I don't use synthetic wigs. I go, but they would obviously have synthetic wigs. They're, they're young girls. They can't afford real hair wigs. So anyway, they all had these like bubble cups, and when you switched them around, there really wasn't that kind of big of a difference. Yeah, I, I couldn't. <laughs> they looked the same almost. And I even bought the wig, and I showed how I would like it to be done. I just thought, wow. Well. What about with the costumes? Do you um, oh, recall God. any specific debacles with any of the dead scenes? Oh my God! We were barely ever making it in time with these dresses anyway for performance. They would rehearse. Usually we would rehearse the performance on a Saturday and shoot on a Monday. So, like on Thursday, they came and said, look, we lost our location for a Saturday, so we're going to shoot Heavy Heavy, which is, was two weeks away. We're going to shoot that on Saturday. I said, uh, uh, I, barely, I haven't started that. I just, you know, oh, okay, okay, so we're rushing it. I have no lining in the dress. The, the squares are all in the strange places. It, it, boobs are coming out. The boots were made, but they were very uncomfortable. I didn't realize that the fishnets and the boots were a really bad idea. Really bad idea. Their feet were totally blistered. So it was a, just as nightmarish as that the scene is to watch. It was just as nightmarish for them to be in those clothes. But it looked good. I mean, Beyonce looked good. <laughs> I remember my first meeting with Bill. <laughs> he supplied us with a DVDs of rehearsal, you know, t uh, choreography. And I remember the first time I saw it, I thought, wow, 
this looks really athletic. It doesn't look anything like, you know, the shifty moves of the, of the time. And I thought, like for me, one of the biggest challenges was whether to illustrate period accuracy or modern interpretation. And um, <clears throat> so I, would, I remember thinking, wasn't Dreamgirls supposed to have happened before Lycra and PowerNet? Yes. So uh, what happened? <laughs> well, we, we hired a very uh, a choreographer who did a lot of modern, more modern type dancing and worked with a lot of hip hop artists and stuff. And she was, luckily, because Jennifer couldn't do half the moves, it did have to calm down. But she didn't understand that I just, you know, I kept with the period look. Because I think it's great when you're struggling in a tight dress. I mean, that's what they did. So we were having a press conference. It was all the international press and all of the producers in a big circle. And they go, oh, what was your biggest uh, challenge on the show to the choreographer? And she said, Sharon's designs, they were just killing it for me. And the room got so quiet, you could hear a pin drop. The producers and everybody, and I was like, I can't believe she said that. <laughs> I just said, yeah, well, I'm sorry, Fatima, it's, it's 1960. I can't, you know, just don't wear spandexy things that are created to move like how they move now. But she was no longer invited to any more press. DreamWorks Paramount down there said, no, you can't. You're trying to sell the movie. <laughs> Well, you know, on a movie like Dreamgirls, we could have just copied research, but we didn't. And so how, when, when, how do you know when to stay true to the period and when to take creative license? Um, well, I was working with Bill, and we decided that I should, when the girls start becoming a little more sophisticated, that I would... I took real period dresses, but I would cut down the necklines on some of them and um, just enhance them, made them a little more sexier than they really were. And then I also, Jennifer had, you know, she, we just made her this like always bejeweled, always soothed for always too much because she could handle it, number one, and it's really Effie. I mean, uh, Effie, we just channeled this, you know, she, she, I felt she demanded, she, she needed it to help her. So she was that, and, and it was, um, you, I mean, you're hired to be creative. You're, you're not hired to stay right into the period, I mean. What about Ray? Ray? Ray or King Richards, aren't you working on King Richards? Yeah. Well, Did you, any creative license on those, or? Um, well, something like, the story of Venus and Serena is so much press on them. So it's only the private moments in the house or when they're not in the press, that's where you get the creativity. You know, you get to, you get to make, help this family become the family. That's when we take our, that's when we really go for it. We get to be our creative selves. When you're just like at a tennis match, they have to wear what they wore at the tennis match. If you can get Reebok or Nike or Adidas to prove it. Well, nowadays, more and more movies, uh, costumes are relying on 3D printing. Can you give us any notes on that? Well, I have never used it, but when I came on the second season of Westworld, because Trish had designed the pilot, and then they carried those clothes throughout the whole first season, they had to replicate them, so they they did that. But unfortunately, the film, because you can't use cotton or natural fiber, it just never looked the same on camera. So I realized that you have to, if you're going to do that, you have to start with it. You know, it can't be. It really looks completely different next to a natural fiber when you're trying to match it. So I would suggest not doing that. <laughs> that was digital, right? I uh, mean, uh, the, the no, we shot in 35, 35 millimeter. Yeah, Westworld uses 35 millimeter. Oh. Okay, well, guys, it looks like I'm done. <laughs> it's your turn. Um, so I have two questions. 
First, I've been a fan of yours for a very long time, and I thank you for all the work you have given to us. My first question is, do you remember what was the budget for wardrobe on Dreamgirls? Ah, uh, yeah. Can you share? I remember that. <laughs> Can you share? <laughs> um, it was 1.2 million, including labor. <gasps> okay, and then my second question is a bit more serious. Can you talk about your experience as a woman of color in this business? I don't even know how to start. <laughs> Here's my history. I was born in Louisiana, but from two to five, I lived in Germany. Then I went to I went to I lived in Illinois until high school, and all my high school was in Japan and a year of college. So my experience in the United States is kind of not too great. I mean, I don't have a grasp of America. I didn't have a grasp of America when I moved here. So out of my ignorance, I really didn't think about that. <laughs> I just thought I was Sharon. So sometimes I'd bulldoze my way into something not, and just bulldoze my way, and bulldoze my way. And as a human being, which is, you know, I got a complete ignorance. And I, you know, I'd go into interviews and I'd constantly lose them, but it just, but I, you couldn't stop me. <laughs> Like like all of us, you know, but um, I I don't I don't know I just feel like maybe I just got fortunate, the jobs I got and the people I met who would just be a little more liberal who were trusting me with their projects because they weren't all black at the beginning, you know. Or Percy Adlon, who's a German director, with the younger and younger, he gave it to me. He just really liked my energy, so I just grabbed onto anything. But I, I don't, I guess you really have to believe in yourself, more or less, and, and, and try to push forward without putting your limitations on yourself, which is being a woman and being a woman of color. I mean, all, you know, you just have to, it's not blind eye, but you've got to not let that hold you back ever and just keep going. And I just feel like I just somehow started at a clear window. You know, I came in, I got the squeeze in there somehow. Maybe they were looking for having people of color be designers, you know? I don't. I really don't know. Since I'm really an acting, singing major, I don't even know how this even happened. I just know I'm very fortunate, and, I, and I'm very happy. <laughs> but And I do, you know, really strive to help other people who are struggling and trying to get into the door. Sharon Raphael from Macy's Studio Services. Well, hi, Raphael from Studio Services. Uh, I was just wondering, how do you go about your hiring process? Like at studio, when people see your name, everybody's like, oh, Sharon's here. It's like You're like yeah. an icon to a lot of us. How do you go about the process when somebody wants to work with you? Well, it's pretty hard because I make 92, <laughs> and I only hire my assistant designer. I can th suggest. To my supervisor, people that I've worked with before, or people I like, I like to see on the set, and that's kind of how that works. I, I don't feel like I should get in the way of 705 that much. I feel like the supervisor has a right to work with a core of people that that make her team efficient. And if I keep throwing in, I can I, I'll throw in like two people maybe. But I will, sometimes I'm very strong about set people. If I've worked with them before and, and, and that actor has, then I do step in. But I will just keep nudging at them. Oh, I really like <laughs> I think I just try them out. Just call them, day check them, you know. And, you know, hopefully. But it's, it's kind of, you have to kind of be respectful. Do uh, you guys feel, I don't know, maybe you guys don't feel the same way. I feel like you have to be respectful of your supervisors a little bit. Or not. No. <laughs> now, you've mentioned that um, the, the media business is picking up and that the actors are, are world-weary because they're acting and acting and acting. Um, how is that affecting designers themselves and what advice would you give to a young designer who is trying to get their ears wet in the industry? Wow. I, I really think it's trying to get into the door of Amazon, Netflix, 
Lou. I, I mean, once you're in there, you're kind of just you kind of just keep working in that media, I believe. So even just a small show that they have, and just doing that, if it's hooked to one of those streaming networks, this is just a great way to get in, I believe. Even if it's not a TV show or film, it's just one of their, you know how they have like a five minute something, yeah, short. But they, they seem, and Netflix definitely is, if you're a person of color or, or a minority, they definitely are pro. I mean, they really are searching for that. And I'm sure Amazon is too. But I know Netflix is very active like that. You can always just send your resume and make sure they know that you're looking. Netflix. Hi, I have Hi. a question about a specific character from The Watchmen. His name is Looking Glass. Oh yeah. I'm really curious. Does he actually see anything through his mask, or like? Well, he can see through that mask. Really? But the mask is CGI. Like he has <sighs> a piece of sh like fabric that's like a lame. Because that's what. But like, that doesn't have that effect. Yeah, I thought it was like a lady. But sometimes or we would use like it. Yeah. yeah. But this is a great mirror effect that they put on top of it. I actually thought it's actual fabric that you can know, see through, or it's nice? like a latex. Oh, they wanted it to be real fabric. Okay. It, it, it went through a lot of tests, but it had to be CGI. Hi, Nancy Grassi here. Um, Sharon, I feel that when we do period piece, um, we really must honor the period, and at the same time, we must make it palatable to the period that we are currently in. And I feel that this is something you really, really did in this film. Oh, I, I, I lived this, through this period, and when I watched this movie, I feel that you really honored the period. And at the same time, you really made it palatable to the current audience. And I'd just like you to speak on that a little bit. Yeah, I, Felipe had asked me about that. It, it is, it, and it's just sort of like I would actually take the vintage dresses and I would just reshape them a little bit. To make the neckline, you know, instead of a jewel neck, maybe just keep it a little. Bring the sleeve in, not have it cut here. Uh, just subtle changes, maybe a little more darting in the dress instead of it just being straight. Just constantly, you know, I, I would say just adding some finesse and tailoring. Um, and maybe just a little more sexy. Just to <laughs> So I want to know with Beyonce's look, how did you get inspired by the Nubian goddess oh. photo shoot? Like, oh, I was so proud taken by that. I love that one. Why did I like, come? Oh, I really wanted to do that. I remember, I remember when we I had illustrated a, oh, yeah. it. Yeah, and I had a book, the book of African stuff, and I said, "Oh my God, we have to do this." I said, "How do I approach somebody to say I'm going to paint your skin really dark?" But Beyonce loved it. Because yeah. I noticed you use like really uh, traditional colors of African culture, like yeah. the bright canary, marigold yellow, and then the emerald green. Like you really showed the Afrocentric of it all, like in that photo shoot. Yeah. I really like related to that. Quite, it was quite fun. That was a really chic change. For that Very song, chic. Yeah. yeah. We really had a good time with that. Everything worked about that yeah. piece, yeah. I saw that uh, Jennifer Hudson's uh, character early on, she was wearing, you know, like the traditional same dress as the rest of them. But then when she did the clean break, you made a conscious choice to change her. Into Aretha Franklin. Yes. She became. <laughs> that's exactly what I yeah, was trying to figure out. Who is she channeling? Everyone was inspired by some artist from that time. She's Aretha Franklin. So the, you know, bohemian, yeah. the whole bohemian look that she was right. doing was Aretha Franklin. Yeah. That's fantastic. I love and I, she was more comfortable in it, too. You, yes. could, you could feel her being more comfortable in it. So it was kind of, I was, I, 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 I was really happy that she was comfortable. <laughs> Hi. Um, so you said everyone was channeling someone from that era. Well, she, basically. Who, yeah. was, who, was the other, who were the other two inspired well, by? Was, I mean, um, Jamie's Barry Gordy, anyway. That's pretty much what the play is. Anika is not channeling anybody, so she's a, she's Lorraine. <laughs> yeah, she is, but she she's such a great actress and a comedic timing. It just was really fun to work with her as as her how she was portraying her character. Because she's just she was so great with her comic timing. 
Um, that's pretty much, I think, I, and, and Cece, he was more of a hipster. You know, he was always that at the beginning and stayed that way. Um, but that was, he didn't channel anybody. <laughs> Just the singers, did. I mean, Eddie did and the girls. More of a personal question. Um, not just because we're in a new year, but I would be curious to know what it is that you're opening yourself up to next. Oh, what I'm working on right now? Not necessarily working on. More of a personal question. What oh. are you opening yourself up to now? Well. <laughs> <laughs> on your downtime. <laughs> More of my downtime, believe it or not. Yeah, I did live in Japan for a long time, so I am actually a Buddhist. So I do actively, I am actually what's called a district leader in my Buddhist community, and it's a very, very busy job. It's, I have about 20 members, so I do that when I'm not working, and I do it when I'm working, so I really love it, and it's very encouraging, and that's pretty much the other part of my life, yeah. Hello. Hi. I'm Jerisa Featherstone. Hi. Jerisa. I want to know, as an inspiring designer, do you have any regrets? Do you have any projects that you look back on and like, man, I shouldn't have taken that? Or do you oh, think that every oh, project yeah, had its purpose? Yeah, I tried purpose? to take them off the, you know. <laughs> I don't, you know, I don't know if there's so much regrets. You just, you, you know, everything's such a good life lesson. You know, I just, just wave is, Horrible sci-fi movie I did. I remember that. Just everything was wrong from the day I took it, and I should have said no, but I did it. And it was a complete nightmare. I mean, people yelling, and, and it looked horrible, and I just thought, well, you know, you can't take it back, but you can learn from it. So you don't want to ever, okay, everything, I, you know, but then you can't really learn from it because the people will be totally different on the next film, and it'll be a different project. But you can be aware you have to be aware if if you feel in your gut that it's not the personality is not working well if yours isn't working well with theirs and they're not really respecting you i i, I feel at my age it's time to leave and they should get somebody who who work well with them i should have left that job horrible <laughs> we know how hard this industry is at all levels uh without giving names, and what do you think was the hardest five minutes of your life on a scene? <laughs> you, know what scene? I'm you know what I'm talking You know what I'm saying. Like, close. You know, like, it's got to be there. It's not there. Oh, there, you know? oh, right. You know oh, I mean? yeah. Oh, my God. Many of those, right? So many. <laughs> the hardest one. So many times you don't, you, you think, is this really going to happen? Exactly. Is it really? Is it, I'm gonna, am I going to make it? Yeah, exactly. Uh, and it always happens, right? I think even Watchmen, we, you know, we Regina came in late. They couldn't find a mask to work for her face. We went through about 30 different masks. And like in two days she was filming. And I just said, you know what? Why don't we just spray paint her face? <laughs> and I said, because that we're not changing her face, really. Because it just she's very delicate. And... Everything was just overwhelming on her. I said, just, just like, just put a black, like, then you could do it on camera, like she's airbrushing her face. Let's just see, and then that became it. I mean, the costume originally was a nun's costume, with a, that the white thing, it just didn't look good, it just didn't work on her. So we had to go through, no, you really can't. It didn't work for her for some reason. It would be problematic, yeah. And then the hood came, like, because she had, you know, hood of justice's thought. It was like, had to make that trouble. It was like, and that was just two days of place. Like, and, and the idea that, you know, that whole watch was very challenging. And the fact he did not, he wanted it low tech. Well, we've gotten a pretty good insight on Sharon's heart, her <laughs> hand, and her love of music. What we don't know about Sharon is what's to come. Felipe. Or Felipe, what's to come. <laughs> well, thank you, Sharon. He's awesome. Thank you. Thank you.